Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're here with our legendary guitar department from Berkeley. I'm Damien Bracken. I'm the Dean of Admissions. And we're here today to talk about stylistic diversity in the guitar department. And I'm joined by Kim Perlack, the chair and the assistant chair, Cheryl Bailey, and two of our tremendous faculty members um, who will introduce themselves as we go. So Kim, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Damien. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department. And um, we're really excited to be here with you um, for this latest installment in our series about stylistic diversity in the department. Um, many of you who know about the guitar department know that we really are the largest guitar department in the world and the most stylistically diverse. And we really pride ourselves on helping everybody find their own voice by going as deep as you want to go when you come here and as broad as you'd like to go and, and hopefully picking up some new things you don't expect to learn along the way. So to that end, um, as Damien said, Cheryl Bailey is here, great jazz guitar player and our assistant chair. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Yep. Um, and we've got um, right here in my office, this is Jeffrey Lockhart, professor of guitar. Hello. Great funk guitar player. And uh, down the hall, but in his own Zoom Square, uh, Tim Miller, great jazz guitarist and professor of guitar. Hey, Tim. Hi. Um, we're really excited that both of you are here today. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to hear Tim and Jeffrey, please do that. Uh, we have a lot of resources up if you search Berkeley Guitar Department on YouTube. Um, we have videos of them um, in a in a playlist that's named after this series so you can go right there and listen to them and then you can explore further and so what you'll hear is that they're very different guitar players but what's kind of cool about both of you is that both of you have a ton of students who want to study with you all the time you're always getting a waiting list um jeffrey one one of my favorite things was one time um jeff decided he was going to have auditions for the lettuce ensemble that he runs. Remember when you had auditions mm -hmm. and like 80 people signed up in the first 15 minutes and there's just no way there'd be no time to do it. So I think one thing um, that would be fun to start with is what do you think, like Tim, I'm going to start with you. Are there things like, because you teach students of many different backgrounds, many of whom like some of them want to play exactly the style you play but many of them don't they just want to study with you like what are some fundamental things that you think all students should be thinking about and focusing on that have really helped you in your playing well yeah i i, I think that uh you know a lot of my students are are maybe familiar with my playing or something like that but they come from you know a, a, a diverse backgrounds you know, stylistically, uh, and and often just want to get some of what maybe I have to offer, and kind of figure out a way to get it into their style of playing or how they do it. Um, so my my first approach is always just to you you know to ask them what they're into, maybe name several artists that they listen to, maybe show me some of their music. Um, you know, just play me something or show me some recordings just so I can kind of get into their zone of, you know, where they are as a player and a composer and a musician in general. And then then that helps me to, to, to start teaching them. But I would say, to, to answer your question directly, I would say that um, the the thing that I get to right away is, is uh, the idea of tone and and time uh, because I think that you know across all of the different genres and, and, and styles I think for, for me just the sound the articulation the tone that you get and the time feel and you know the dynamics and all the things that go along with with that are kind of kind of go go to all the styles and it's kind of like the same thing so um, I, I, I like to go into that zone with my students and just talk about specifically what they're into. But those are the two main things. Tim, do you think that there are one or two things that come to mind, maybe that people take for granted about their tone or their time before they come to you, like things they haven't thought about? 
that maybe people could start thinking about now if they want to practice what you're yeah um uh, you know with the topic of dynamics um a, a common thing that happens when i when i say okay let's play a phrase and then let's let's treat it with dynamics like a better dynamic approach a lot of times the student will play louder so the dynamic will be loud so they'll play the phrase and they'll hit something really hard and it will kind of maybe fret out or compress or something like that the note but one thing that a lot of people that i you know work with um you know that, that we kind of touch on is that you know with guitar with its what i would say limited dynamic range as an acoustic instrument i think the soft notes and the quiet notes are often you know almost like the ghost notes the lower range of the dynamics are the thing that the students don't consider and i think that in my opinion those should be considered first kind of like going from the quietest sound up until sort of the loudest sound you can get on that particular instrument. So we explore their particular guitar, see how loud it can go and how soft it can go, you know, silence and, and how much they can kind of control that, um, you know, and that, that turns into a really huge project, you know, like a lifetime project. But it's something that I think people are not generally aware of uh, until, until we get into it. Mm. Jeffrey, what do you think about tone and time what are a few things that come to your mind it, right away? it's funny that tim just mentioned ghost notes because my last student just now i was trying to teach him how to play a ghost note you don't have to play the picking line each note at the same volume so i was trying to show him how to play less on <clears throat> one note and then higher on the other and also utilize space. Mm -hmm. Tone is funny with me because I think um, I've always felt that tone comes from your fingers. Mm -hmm. And of course you can adjust the, the amp, but your main sound comes through your fingers. Mm -hmm. That's hard to teach a student. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can get them to play with their heart, then they can bring out that tone. Mm -hmm. What about time? Because I know that time is a fundamental in your playing. And people have said that, like, you have great time, you know, so many people hear you play and think like, he can play one part of the beat and I can feel the groove. Like, how do you, how do you think about time? Time is tricky. Um, <laughs> Cause not everyone has good time. Mm -hmm. And, but I have found through teaching here mm -hmm. that you can help a student find his own time in his body. It comes from here. And if you can get them to play with their heart, I think a lot of things based on uh, based on the heart. You know, if you can get them to play with their feeling deep down inside, then time will come naturally. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, of course, you can work with a metronome. I always tell them to lock into a drummer you know focus on the drummer if he has good time then that should help you keep your place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what do you think it does like when you say you play from your heart do you think that has a physical impact on people like do you notice the difference of the tension or the way they approach mm -hmm. the instrument yeah i went to see eric gale last night mm -hmm. and that guy plays from his heart. I invited a lot of students and they were, it's funny, all the Berkeley students were right down front dancing more <laughs> than anybody in the club. And I was just pointing them out. I'm like, those are some of my students right there. <laughs> all night they danced. But I think they danced because of Eric's heart and soul that he puts into his plan, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, that he plays with so much passion because of what's going on mm -hmm. or what's going on in his life. He lost his dad from COVID. Mm -hmm. He and his wife caught COVID and was separated for the first time ever. So he came to the gig last night with so much passion. And I think when you play with passion like that, it touches everyone. Tim, I think 
one of the other things that I was thinking about when I thought about you and Jeffrey here together is that you both have had solo projects. You've both played with really strong personalities in duos and trio contexts, band contexts. And now you also have this part of your career where you're teaching at Berkeley and you have like a, you know, people come to you, they know you. So I'm wondering like, as you started to develop your sound, how did you do that? And then also be able to kind of compliment someone else's sound when you're playing with, whether you're playing with the person or whether you're sitting with the person as a student, like how do you develop a distinctive sound, do you think, and then be able to adapt to someone else? Do you have some advice for people about that? Um, I, I think a, a, a distinctive sound uh, probably comes from, uh, that's a tough one to, to, to answer exactly, I think, but I think it comes from, uh, you, you know, your combination of what you've heard, you know, and what kind of sticks with you in sort of in your heart, you know, like the things that really move you, I think, um, that you keep going back to and listening to and you sing in your head when you're listening and it becomes a sort of like, uh, organic transfer of energy from that player in to you and it stays with you. I think those types of musical experiences become part of your memory. And, uh, and I think that when you're playing for real, I think that memory kind of kicks in and it kind of uh, creates this um, unique combination of things that are swirling around. I, I, it's kind of a strange answer, but it, I think that's actually what's really happening, you know? And so that unique combination of musical memories and thoughts turn into, I, th I think, something that no one else can have except you, because you've only experienced those things. Um, and then, then on, on top of that, I think it's, uh, then you have this, this thing where you have your own ideas. Um, and I don't know if those come from influences or if those just come because you are who you are. I don't know what they are. It's, that's too hard to, to figure out. But I think you have this little section of things you've heard and this little section of like, well, I think that I have my own ideas here. And, and then there, there's that balance between all of that stuff. And I think that's ultimately what is your your own sound and then you start to hear that music and that sound in your head and i think those who are aware of that aware of that kind of thing that's going on in their head and they pay attention to it and try to bring it out in the instrument i think those are the people that end up with you know a unique aspect of their sound those who maybe ignore it and push it off to the side and get distracted by other things tend to not have that. So I think that just getting that awareness of like, what, what do I actually hear? What do I want? You know, and, and actually thinking about like making that in, impo an important part of your artistry and trying to pull it out of your mind and trying to get it onto the instrument. That's, I think, I think that's how one finds their own sound. And maybe also, you know, yeah, making it a make, making it a priority to to find out what it is, you know, and to hear it and manifest it. I think that's that's it. That's how one does. Yeah, I think so. I think you think at some level you have to give yourself permission to do it. To, yeah. You know. And, and so, realize that this type of thing is happening, you know, and, 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 and paying attention to it, you know, because it can be really satisfying to kind of go into your mind, pay attention to that thing that you always wanted, and then try to do it. And even if it doesn't come out exactly like you imagined, at least, at least you went down that path. And then you can find some pretty special things about your, your own playing. So the light's going off here, but I think it's going to turn off. <laughs> There we go. I don't like <laughs> no, it sounded like you really said something important and then the light came on, right? <laughs> Literally, right? Yeah, the light bulb went on. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tim, as you're becoming aware of that kind of artistic sensibility, 
what were some of the things that you were really practicing, like really shedding on that just helped get you fretboard knowledge and, and um, you know, just kind of chops and, and nuts and bolts and things like that? Um, well, the, the, a lot of things. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, like most musicians, I think scales really help. Just mm -hmm. playing scales because uh, I think it's like an ear training thing, just being able to hear the difference between major scales, melodic, minor, harmonic, minor, you know, harmonic, major, the symmetric, you know, diminished whole tone scales, all that stuff, and then singing along with the scales. That was always a big thing for me, just playing and then like humming or singing and always trying to connect my ear to everything that I was working on. So if it was, you know, if it was that kind of shedding, it was like ear training and technical at the same time. And it was also tone and time, like I mentioned earlier. So trying to practice with a good sound all the time, trying to sing, trying to play in tempo, trying to get the whole thing kind of like put together. So there was no moment of being, you know, just my fingers moving. That was one big priority for me always. Just don't let the fingers just move and not pay attention to what's what's going on. So if I was playing a scale and I'm still like this, a scale to me is a melody. Mm -hmm. It's just a melody that goes up and it sounds like a melody to me. So it, a major scale just sounds like a song. So I'm going to play it dynamically like a song. And, and, you know, if I was practicing arpeggios or, you know, diatonic things, those all just sound like melodies to me. So I try to approach playing those types of things like I would play any other song with dynamics, a tone, sort of like, you know, directing it how I want it to be, you know, coming from my, my musical mind. Jeffrey, what about you? How did you kind of find your sound? Wow. Um, I think mainly being exposed to all kinds of music. I grew up listening. My father listened. Sunday was his music day. <laughs> And I had to get up with him and go in the living room and sit on the couch from when I was young mm -hmm. and go through his genres, classical. And then he would go to big band jazz. He'd go to jazz vocalists. He'd go to Wes Montgomery, Kenny Burrell. I'd want to go back in the room and listen to Jimi Hendrix and <laughs> James Brown. So I had all these influences going on at the same time. Every summer we went to new newport jazz festival and i remember one year it changed my life because sly and the family stone and james brown were on the same day <clears throat> sly and the, no sly and the family stone was the night before this is 1966 and when i saw james brown come out with those two drummers and that huge band that changed me forever that's the first time I danced. I think I had to be eight years old and I stood up on the chair and I started dancing like crazy. My parents were looking at me like, wow. What? So all those things, Jimi Hendrix, uh, when I first heard him, I was always in the rock. Just all those genres of music, I think helped mold my sound. What's important to you about your sound? What do you care about? Um, well, because I play electric, mm -hmm. I like a good amp, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a lot of amps don't cut it, but when you get the right one, then that helps with your sound, you know, or mm -hmm. the right guitar too. What are you listening for though? When you make a note, like, what uh, do you want it to be like? I want the response to mm -hmm. be there. Mm -hmm. If I play a note in the guitar, I want it to react to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds like uh, like the guitar is alive, but it is. Mm -hmm. The guitar is alive when you hold it. And the amp, I don't know. You just imagine playing to a cheap Sears amp compared to an amp like a vintage Fender. There's a huge difference. So basically you need good equipment. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Took me a long time to get some good equipment, but. I'm happy right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what are you working on right now? 
as you develop your sound and what goes into your playing? Like, what kinds of things are you practicing? I'm feeding off of the students because okay. these young kids, mm -hmm. they think different all the time. Every semester is different. Mm -hmm. And you always get one that just has something different going on. So I take it. <laughs> <laughs> You I, steal. I absorb it. <laughs> I absorb so many different things from each student. Mm -hmm. So that helps me with my sound also. And um, mm -hmm. right now I'm listening to everything. I'm, I found mm -hmm. some old classical music, mm -hmm. some French, something out of France from way back. I like uh, Shazam or something, that mm -hmm. app that you can put on the, the tune. Mm -hmm. And then it tells you what tune it is, and then you can get the whole list of albums and everything. Mm -hmm. So I downloaded a whole bunch of old classical music. Cool. That's really beautiful. So I'm going to study that. Cool. Um, Cheryl, what's on your mind at this moment? Well, I was thinking about um, what Jeffrey and Tim were talking about with tone. Well, well two things. I mean, one, one thing, you know, Tim was saying is, you know, if you just play a scale, it should be musical in that mm -hmm. idea of that. What you practice should translate to the bandstand, should be practical. You know, so you shouldn't just go, I'm going to play the scale and throw out paying attention to your sound and the articulation. Um, and also what Jeffrey was saying, really, I connected with that about the tone of the electric guitar. If you play electric guitar, your instrument is the guitar plugged in through the amp and the sound that comes through the speaker. That's what your instrument is, because you're not going to play a gig with an unplugged electric guitar, right? And and developing that, like now I know Tim, you do a lot of stuff with different overdrives and delays, and also Jeffrey too. You guys are really electric guitars. So I'm curious what your thoughts about in terms of developing your sound, you know, Kind of like Tim was saying, you know, like you, if you practice a scale, it's got to be musical, but also practicing with those sounds. Um, how do you how do you approach doing that? Like if you're going to be working with uh, an overdrive with a lot of compression or a lot of reverbs, um, how do you work with that with students or how do you work with that and on both? There, I'd love to hear both of how you talk about developing the electric guitar sound. Well, I think it for me, it, it starts with. Um, the the moment that the the string is it, you, you strike the string of the pick so i feel like i feel like the tone starts right at that moment with for me a lot of it is just how you pick basically like where you pick the angle that you pick with or if you're a finger style player just the you know what's happening between the nail and, and the, the flesh if you're a pick style player like the angle of the pick actually and how much of it kind of goes down into the string and pulls up on the string sort of the bloom of the note so much of your sound or so much of my sound comes from that moment that the note is picked so um, I would say that most of my sound is that is that moment the way the note comes out and then there are smaller elements with with the fretting hand that that like where has a little bit to do with pressure but um, just enough to get the note to sound kind of pure the way I want it and also where I I fret the note like it's usually very close to the fret itself so I know it when I find that connection like when I pick it and I get a, a really nice sort of timbre with the pick and I know when the string starts vibrating in my fingers in the place where I get that sort of like synergy, like the whole thing comes together. So when, when I play a note and it's got that thing, I try to keep doing that. So it's a good pick sound. It's a good sort of ringing. It's, a, you know, everything's kind of working together. So essentially every note that I play, I'm doing that all the time. And I'm really, really aware of it because I, um, I feel like, um, I feel like that's how I can sort of sing through the instrument. Like if I, if I'm singing with my voice and the guitar is sort of like ringing the way I want it to ring, 
then that whole sort of loop can happen and then I can kind of get lost in the music and then my tone feels right. Um, so that whole thing has to happen because the pickup is going to hear that. And then that's going to go through the volume and the tone control. And that can be slightly adjusted for EQ. And then that goes out through the cable. And it doesn't matter what pedal or what amplifier, if that start of the sound is not happening in my mind, the overdrive pedal and the blah, 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 all the reverb and the, the amp and all that stuff is going to hear that. And it's just going to, it's going to output that. So basically, something good that goes in is going to end up, the pedal's going to respond to it. Something not so good that goes in, the pedal's going to respond to that. So I have to have that thing before the gear even matters. So I look at it like this. Gear is not important at all when you start as a player and don't have a touch. When you develop your touch, gear becomes extremely important for me because then, then the whole loop starts and everything listens to everything else and then everything comes out. So that's kind of how I look at the whole signal chain. That's great. That's funny you mentioned that gear is not important as the touch because a lot of times I practice without the gear right without the amp without anything to get strong i'm stronger that way because i have to pull the sound out of the guitar without the you know without the amp yeah so um that's how i approach it really getting my sound is practicing without the amp mm -hmm. and then when i can tighten that sound up then i know when i plug in the amp if it's a decent amp i can get my sound as far as pedals, I don't really, I haven't connected with distortion yet. The only time I use a distortion is when I want feedback or I want to enhance a certain part of the song. Um, I love the envelope filter because it's really funky. It's got that little bite sound to it. I like the wah-wah for colors and... There's a couple of other, but they have so many pedals out now. I just grab what I like. There's a new pedal I got that sort of sounds like a chorus and a flanger. And it takes me back to the 60s, you know, when Jimi Hendrix used to get real psychedelic or The Doors, you know, any one of those groups out of the 60s. So that's mainly how I develop my sound is practicing without an amp. One thing I liked on Guitar Duo Night was mm -hmm. the way Kim utilized space with her, her music. You could see her breathing in between certain sections of the tune and you breathe with her. That's how I try to approach some of my solos. I want people to breathe with me, you know. I don't play a lot of notes and uh, kind of try to approach it like it's a violin, like a romantic piece of music, and pick good notes to play. Not a lot of notes, just good ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, space, that's great. Yeah. I mean, space usually happens when people are listening. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like, I, I feel, you know, I can't comment for Kim, but probably in that moment, my perception of that would be Kim was probably playing something and then you're just listening to the decay of the note and that's the space. <laughs> so I usually right, yeah. listen well naturally use space because they're just listening to the whole thing and listening to the, the all the stuff they're playing but they're also listening to the way the note just falls into the space and that whole that whole listening all the time thing usually creates that you know it's interesting that you say that because when i look at the three of you here who i've heard play and and played with on uh, as guitarists i think everybody here really uses space beautifully and thinks of it as a 
you know, the, the rest are notes. And um, for me, I think that was hard when I was younger. I remember when I was in college, the hardest thing for me when I walked out on the stage by myself, because I'm a classical guitarist, but I always walk out by myself and playing from memory wasn't the playing part. It was the moment where you sit down and, and like, you know, what's in front of you. Then you become hyper aware of like who's in the front row and what color the floor of the stage is. And like, and I always felt like it's time to start. And I, I had a friend who like, we would go into the concert hall and we literally like pretend we were kind of saging it out, you know, like, and you have to repeat this mantra, like when you walk on the stage, like it belongs to me and I can take all the time in the world and kind of give yourself that opportunity to listen. But I think to me, when I hear like, when, when I feel like someone takes a lot of space in a groove or like Tim, you play these like beautiful, incredibly fast lines sometimes. And then you let, the way they dovetail into one another, um, the way that you were, I was watching you play on a gig a month ago or so ago and the, the way that you comped and, and just the space in between there. And then Cheryl, like when you were playing with David Gilmore the other night, like the way that you came in and out of different parts of the pieces, I feel like it takes a lot of courage to, to let the space be there and listen to it. Cause you're not rushing in with the next thing you feel like you have to play. You're really like, centered in the moment and i think that takes some work to achieve and I, I think that um every time for me i have to like kind of put myself in that space where i'm just gonna like give myself a minute you know whether it's like i sit out there and i just look around at the audience or i tune and i just kind of give myself a second to like transition into like playing mode and not feel like kind of outside world mode so I don't know how that feels for, for all of you, but that's kind of how I feel about it. Like, how does that feel for you? Um, you said a lot. I'm trying to, uh, would you say, say that again? Well, I feel like, I mean, the thing I'm kind of wondering about Jeffrey is like, I feel like when you play, like I'm thinking about a duo that you played really recently with Chris at Guitar Session. So there's all this stuff going around you. Mm -hmm. And you were setting up sometimes, and like you're saying before, you're not playing a ton of notes, mm -hmm. but you're playing them like right at the right time, right at the right time. And I think for a lot of students and a lot of people listening, it would be like terrifying to think of not playing a lot of notes because if you're not filling up the space, mm. Do you know what I'm saying? It mm -hmm. kind of makes you feel like, oh my God, but you're able to kind of center yourself and kind of, so how does that feel when you do it? Like, how do you do that? I, I think that's uh, age. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's what happened. You know, I mean, I got better over time when I look at some of the clips of me. Mm -hmm like in my early 30s, late 20s. Totally different, Jeff. But now I'm kind of like getting like fine wine. <laughs> you know, just trying to relax and take my time and really think about what I'm going to say. And again, I always think of people I love. Every time I play, I think of someone I love you know, and who inspired my life and inspired my music. I go, I go to them in the back of my head and I just play. Mm -hmm. Of course you have to do homework, but that's what it comes down to with me. It's about life. Mm -hmm. Jeff, when you played um, big high profile concerts, like big tours with a ton of people mm -hmm. there, did you find that you could find the space that you're talking about in that moment? Were you able to do that? Yeah, they told me I, I walked to my own beat. Okay. <laughs> can you can you remember like something specific from one of those moments that maybe tell us a story? Well, they used to tell me to look at, like when I played with Brian McKnight, he was always like, Lockhart, you should look at the audience, man, when you play, you know, let, let them know you're an engage you're engaging with them, but I couldn't. 
I couldn't look at them. So I'd come out and I'd do this, you know, I'd get in my own little world. And that's where I felt comfortable. It still went off, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm just not like, uh, I mean, I could never do the Chuck Berry thing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was dynamic. Even Eric Gales last night, he walked out into the audience and he was, he was dancing all through the crowd and playing these solos. And I thought it was fantastic. I mean, to each his own, you know. Mm -hmm. You just have to be yourself. So you found a way, though, to be yourself and play with Brian McKnight and play with Beyonce and play with, like, you were able to be yourself in those contexts mm. and still serve that music, you felt. Beyonce is a little tricky because that was in a studio. Mm -hmm. And I was scared to death. <laughs> I was scared to death being around those people. I, I You know, they laughed at me. Because when, when I did a track and I came into the control room and I'm sitting there like, oh, God, you know, she's sitting here and this, this dude turns around and he says, yo, man, that was fire. And it was Jay-Z. And I got up and I walked out and I covered <laughs> my face and I just left the studio and they were all laughing. But I was terrified. I was terrified. So I, I'm kind of shy in one sense. I mean, I was a little terrified about today, but Kim always calms me down. She's like, you're going to be fine. So here I am. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that when you're terrified? How do you play like yourself? Because I've been terrified. Uh, um, how do you do it? I just connect to the guitar. I love the guitar. Mm -hmm. That's my friend. So... That's how I do it. What about you, Tim? Because I, I wonder how you approach this when when you have to play to like in a very high profile situation to a lot of people, but you're doing something in some ways that's really intricate and intimate. Like, how do you manage that energy? Uh, one thing I found is is to um, to uh, just to listen more closely to the environment that that's helped me um you know when you when you go onto a stage and maybe it's a there's a there's a lot going on the one of the one of the first things that i try to do is i just say to myself okay just just listen because i i feel like if i if i listen to the rest of the band or the other person that i'm playing with if i focus on them and a little bit less on myself, then I just feel like I'm part of a group and it's not just all about me or something like that. And I, I, I find kind of transferring that energy out to the rest of the band and just listening to what they're playing and responding to what they're doing uh, helps a lot because then I'm just part of a conversation, you know, and it, it sort of takes that kind of the feeling that a spotlight's on you or, you know, um, you know, I haven't mastered this in all areas or something like this. There's, there's still moments where, you know, just, you, you know, th things don't go the way you want or, you know, you don't respond in the way that you wanted to. But the, the word I use is always just, just listen, just listen. And that helps tremendously. Cheryl, what about you? Like when, when you're in those situations, Especially if you have some kind of extra adrenaline or, or nerves or whatever. How do you do that? Yeah, well, that, these are always good questions. I mean, one thing is I, I try to think of that. Instead of thinking about I'm nervous, I think about it, try to transform my thought about it and go, I'm excited, really excited to play mm -hmm. with these people. But I think, you know, also, yeah, I love the guitar, so the guitar is my buddy. So I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm there with my buddy and and listening. I mean, I think kind of what both of these folks have said and Kim, what you said too, just taking that space to be relaxed before you play a note and feeling like your feet are on the ground and remembering the experience is is it's a blessing to be able to do what we do. I'm humbled. I'm honored that I get to do that. So if I remember that, everything seems to work out <laughs> you know i think more and more to you I, I i um i think it's true that you can rely on like the foundations that you've set like your sound is in there your preparation is in there and i had one experience in my life where i was playing something really high profile and it 
hit me funny when I walked out on the stage. And I sat down and started playing and, and I never have had this experience before, but I was so nervous I couldn't see. Like I was playing and I couldn't see. And I, I finished and I had no memory of what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And I stood up, like the audience was like cheering and whatever, and I had no memory. And so I like, you know, bowed and it was a class and I went off stage and people were like, you gotta go back out there, you gotta go back out there. And I was thinking like, oh my God, <laughs> I ruined it. I ruined the thing. I ruined this piece. I'm on NPR. I ruined that, you know, and then I go back out and everybody's going nuts and I'm like bowing and I'm still, th I'm about to throw up, I think. And, and, um, uh, I really had no memory. And then it, it was like, you know, people were like, Oh my God. And then the composer comes down and I thought he's going to tell me he hated it. And he was like, that was like life changing. And, and I had nothing. And later the engineer sent me the recording and I thought, Oh yeah. Okay. I sounded like myself, like I sounded fine. So I think it does kick in and people are always worried. But I think what you're all saying is like, there are things you can try to do. And then in the end, like you might not feel the way you think you're going to feel, but hopefully all the stuff you've done in your practicing and the way you think about music kind of carries you. And, you know, I well, think this Kim, I think you said it. I've heard you say it before. You have some way that you say this, but your preparation, you can trust your preparation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a, a teacher that used to say luck favors the prepared, you know? <laughs> so I guess I was lucky. I agree with that. Yeah. It's, it's like, it, it feels like the, the, um, the gigs that I spend a lot of time on the music and really like, you know, just keep going over the, the tunes and like try to get it memorized and all that stuff. Those, those gigs seem to have less of that sort of jumpy feeling than the ones where maybe you have to, to, to read something or where you got, you know, you, or you didn't have enough time to prepare and you feel, you know, you just didn't, you didn't get to it as much as you wanted to. It feels like the other, the prepared gigs somehow, it sort of dampens that 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 feeling that we're all talking about. Tim, there's a technical question for you that one of the students has who's listening. Um, um, part one is um, how do you work on your pull-offs compared to your hammer-ons? You think about that? Yeah, um, it it's about. Um, for me, the the vowel sound that it gets, uh, because you can for for me, I like the the variety of vowel sounds kind of that come from certain types of articulations. Because I, I think if I can get that happening with my fingers, the amp likes that and it responds to it, and you can get some really interesting things that happen, um, uh, like variety. Uh, so when I'm when I'm pulling off a note. Um, I'm trying to get, there's a couple of, there's a couple of vowel sounds that you can get. One's kind of an E and one's kind of a O kind of, kind of sound. And I like, I, so I try to get those two different sounds from my pull off. So again, it's about listening. Um, it will be hard to describe ex exactly how I do that, you know, in an interview like this, you know, I would have to sit down with the, the person and really show them and everything. But, um, um, but the way that the finger moves, there's subtle movements that create the different vowel sounds. So I'm just looking for those sounds. I'm listening a lot and trying to adjust my fingers to get to that thing that I'm looking for. Tim, the other part of the question was, do you feel like the ergonomic guitars that you choose to play affect your tone? Um, affect my tone? That's a really good question. I think that comfort affects tension, mm -hmm. and I think tension or lack of uh, affects pressure and uh, which would probably lead to. Uh, you know, some sort of tonal variety. So I'll say yes, but depending. Okay. <laughs> um, and I think, um, you know, a lot of the people who listen to this are in the process of auditioning to come to Berkeley. And so um, 
we've talked a lot about um, some specifics of that process in the different webinars. We're going to have a special just interview series where we just go through like how you go through the audition. And we'll have that out on YouTube and on Coffee Talk as well. Um, but I'm wondering if each of you could just give a minute of advice. Like if you were going, you both um, sat and, and listened to students in all kinds of different audition capacities. And, and if the two of you were going today to listen to students who are auditioning to Berkeley, what are you listening for? Like what should they know that you're listening for? Jeffrey, what would you listen for? Um, how much they practice. You could mm -hmm. that comes off right away that they put a lot of time in their instrument. Mm -hmm. um, How can you tell? Just by the way they approach their guitar, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. execution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A choice of tune. Mm -hmm. Transcription. Mm -hmm. Like I've heard a couple of people that transcribe some amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know they had to work very hard to do that. Mm -hmm. If it's a simple piece, I just look for, are they serious about what they're doing? Mm -hmm. And um, that's mainly what I look for. I, I think that's right. I think so much of your intention comes across. Um, Damien, I'm thinking about London, when we were in London, there's this one student who's incredible guitar player. And after, I think you were in the room with Bonnie Hayes from the songwriting department and I, and after he left, everyone said like the way he took his cable out of his bag, mm -hmm. we knew he would be the best player of the day. There's just something he did with such intent. Yeah. The way that Jeffrey's describing, like everything you, you do comes across, like your preparation comes across. You really come across in these auditions. Damien, do you feel that way across the board when you go to all these places? Yeah, you know, I think, <clears throat> and thank you for these great comments. You know, th this whole, the concept of, of tone and time applies to every musician, regardless of instrument. I, I think it's the core fundamental essence of music. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all your insights into that. Um, you know, I think the most important thing for, um, students auditioning with Berkeley is to be their authentic self as a musician and to approach the music, um, you know, really from their own personal experience, because that authenticity and sincerity is what comes across loud and clear to us when we're in an audition room with a student. So it's important that you perform music that you love and that you're really attached to and, and feel uh, really expresses your your own voice um, as as an instrumentalist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tim, what about you? What's your advice? Well, uh, you know, what Damien just said was actually the word I was going to use, which is the, the the idea of just the you know, authentic you know, authenticity. Um, because I've done um, a lot of auditions uh, I, uh, for 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 A and I the A and I team, and um, uh, it's you know sometimes students feel pressure to play a certain you know thing. They might say, "Oh, I need to play some, a jazz thing," or "I need to play something complicated," or "I need to do you know, you know just there's so many different things that people would think or you know ideas that people come up with. But I think what well, what I'm generally looking for, and I think what most of us are, or all of us are looking for, is just, you know, what do you, what music are you into? What types of songs do you like to play? You know, what do you, what do you think um, you could come in and just show us what, you, like sort of the core of what you really, really love to do? I think, I think that's what we're really looking for, because that ends up being well, as, as we all know, just a diverse kind of like spectrum of things that people come in with. So uh, to not think that it has to be a certain thing, but to, to go at it from who you are, come in and do that and do it 
with a lot of preparation and a lot of practice. But it's just good to know, I think when you're auditioning for Berkeley, that we're not really looking for a style. We're looking for an authentic musician that does what they do. And then because we have so much going on here, we can kind of direct you in a, a, to a teacher, you know, that that is going to is going to help you do that thing that you do. So uh, I think it's really important for people who are thinking about auditioning to to consider that. That's a great point. I think that's right. We're not looking for like a specific kind of guitar player. We're really looking for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Cheryl, what about you? What's your what's your bit of advice? I think that everybody said it really well. I mean, I've done tons of mm -hmm. um, A and I for Berkeley, and also we've all of us here auditioned ourselves right. and thought about that. What should I play for this audition? And you want to pick that thing that really you can sink your teeth into and that shows you as an instrumentalist and a musician at your best. So that's, that's the concentration. Yeah. I mean, I think I'd like to close this part out by saying that it takes a lot of courage to be yourself. So it's not like we think it's an easy thing. Like to walk into a room in a high pressure situation when you're nervous and just to try to be yourself is really hard to do. But when you do that, it that shows us so much about who you are. And just go with the flow, like prepare as much as you can. And then on the day, just go and be open. Because we're looking for how you try things. Like, I think Cheryl, I think you said one, one time when we were talking about this, like sometimes we're pushing people, like asking them more questions just to see what happens if they get thrown by a curveball. Just what will you do? Just give it a shot. Because that's what your musical life is gonna be like. And when you're here, we hope that you put yourself in all kinds of different situations so that you can learn on the fly. So I think just come and have a good time when you audition. And then and then maybe if you're not in an auditioning phase of your life, um, just see if you can kind of access that courage in whatever musical situation you're in. So um, Damien, do you have any thoughts as we close this one out um, as our director of admissions? and? who's listened to thousands and tens of thousands of guitar players? You know, the thing um, that really struck me when I started working at Berkeley about the guitar department was the depth of stylistic diversity in this department is just, it's a phenomenon. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So the, the access that our students get to guitarists of different genres and um, styles and different approaches and different techniques is just, it's a treasure trove. Right. Um, and so if you do get admitted to Berkeley and, and enroll, um, you know, I would like dig in, I would study with as many of those guitarists as I possibly yeah. could, you know, to get that exposure because, you know, they're, they're all amazing musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to your point, Kim, earlier, you know, to it, it's really important to have stylistic diversity as a player. Mm -hmm. um, it makes you more employable, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to sit in on any type of situation at all. So, yeah, yeah I, I just think and, you know, I would encourage people to explore the website and read the bios of all of the guitar teachers at Berkeley. It will blow you away. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Damien, for, for having us again. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff Lockhart. Thanks. Yeah. It's a great um, conversation. Thank you, Tim Miller. And uh, thank you, Cheryl Bailey. And um, we hope to see some of you here at Berkeley. And, um, and we'll be here for the next one next month. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye.